Well, good morning, uh, everybody, and welcome to this um, event, one of a uh, quite a long series of events that we're holding as part of the IFS Deaton Review of uh, Inequalities. Um, uh, I'm Paul Johnson. I'm going to be uh, chairing this. Uh, we have the most uh, extraordinary um, panel of speakers, um, and you as the audience ought all to have uh, the opportunity to ask questions via the Slido app. Um, so it, let me take that one first on the Slido app. If you have a question, just write it down on there. Um, if you are interested in someone else's questions, do vote it up. I will see the ones at the top of the um, order first, and they're the most likely to get asked. Second, the, the issue here, um, firms, market power, innovation, and inequality. When we set out to um, set out on this huge task that we've set ourselves uh, to look at inequality and inequalities in the round, we were very clear that we weren't just going to be looking at um, things like taxes um, and benefits. Uh, we weren't just going to be looking at um, health, uh, ethnicity, uh, gender and so on. But we really wanted to get at what it is underlying in the economy. Uh, that drives inequality, whether that be inequality of wealth, inequality of earnings, and so on. And therefore, central uh, to our understanding of inequality was going to be um, what happens in the uh, in, uh, among firms, how firms uh, behave, um, and as you see here, how market power develops and how it's used, um, how that relates to innovation and how that relates to uh, inequality. And uh, I think we always saw uh, one of the issues in inequality and government uh, public policy response to it being about uh, the uh, about how we work with firms and the market. So, as I say, we have an extraordinary uh, panel um, to speak uh, today. Um, first up will be uh, John Van Rienen, um, Professor of Economics at the LSE um, and formerly uh, of the uh, of the IFS, who is uh, the author of the main chapter um, in the Deaton Review, or one of the authors of that chapter, he's going to kick off. Uh, we've then got um, Yannick out and uh, Rachel Griffith, who have each um, uh, authored or co-authored um, commentaries on that, on looking at specific issues uh, in, uh, in, in this area. Uh, Jan, of course, is at the Barcelona School of Economics and Rachel at Manchester University and uh, Research Director at the at the IFS. Uh, and then finally, Jean Tirol will, uh, will wrap up. Jean is a member of the uh, Deaton panel. Uh, from He's a professor at Toulouse and, of course, uh, a, a winner of the Nobel M Memorial um, Prize. Uh, so that's how it's going to work. Uh, between them, uh, the four speakers should uh, take up around about an hour. Uh, that should leave around half an hour for questions at the end. Before I hand over to, to John, um, and, and I won't pop up in between them. They'll hand over one to the other. Uh, let me just finally um, and hugely thank uh, the Nuffield Foundation who have uh, funded um, this, uh, this enormous and incredibly important project. So let me hand over to you now, John. So thanks very much, Paul. I will, uh, let me just pull up my, my slides. Uh, hopefully, everybody can uh, can can see those. Paul, is can you see those? Okay, I assume yes. And uh, yes. Silence gives consent. Uh, okay, so um, yeah, I'm delighted to be able to uh, say a few words about the uh, chapter that I have written with uh, Jan de Loka at uh, KU Leuven and Tim Obermeyer at, at the IFS, looking at the general issue of, of firms and uh, and inequality. Um, so we, we tried to have three aims for this chapter. So you know, one was to try and basically pull together many of the things which have happened to the UK business landscape to do with firms over the last few decades, especially on the, uh, the last 20 years, broadly last 25 years since the mid 90s. Um, and we have tried to use a, a, a number of different data sets. We got some new analysis of the near universe of uh, UK company accounts, this data set called uh, Historical Orbis, as well as the more classical kind of uh, administrative data sets from the Office of National Statistics. Um, and part of our aim as a comparative aim is to compare the UK 
with the United States and to some extent other uh, wealthy nations. And the reason for doing this is that there is a lot of um, well-documented uh, evidence, some of it by myself, but most of it by others, which have looked at the US and have seen quite large changes over the last four decades in a number of dimensions. So in particular, there has been an increase of the inequality of the distribution, the dispersion of firm level productivity wages and size, you know, industrial concentration in the in the United States and in, in several other other countries. I mean, sometimes I describe this as kind of increasing differences between between firms. And we wanted to see whether there were similar things happening in the UK or, or, or differences. And the reason that, you know, and I'll get into this next time, we might be, you know, interested or concerned about this is that this has coincided with several other worrying aggregate trends. So, you know, as, as many of you know, and as I'll show you, there's been a, a, a slowdown of productivity growth and, and pay um, in, uh, in, in the US, and I'll show you in the UK. There's been uh, an increase of the ability of firms to mark up price over the the variable costs, and as we well know, general income inequality has been increasing. A third aim of the chapter is to uh, try and assess some of the explanations of these trends and some of the policy implications. I mean, these are very complicated issues. I have too much time to go into this, but I'll give you a taste of it, hopefully, at the end of the talk. So our kind of conclusion, I, I, I guess, overall is that you know, the major UK problem in the last 15 years has been low or no productivity growth, and this has led to a stagnation of wages uh, across the whole of the distribution, the kind of both at the median and at the mean, the middle of the distribution. Um, so the second thing we find is that since the mid 1990s, there has been in the UK this big growth of uh, inequality of productivity and pay across firms. And in particular, we see a phenomena of what's sometimes called superstar firms, the kind of um, larger, very successful firms pulling away from the rest of the pack. Um, so, you know, if, if you look at, say, um, workers, the top 10% of workers in these in these high productivity firms, they, they actually have had sustained productivity and pay growth, whereas those in the middle have actually, uh, like, you know, like the economies of whole, more or less stagnated. The third finding is we do find increases of aggregate kind of price cost mark markups and, and profitability, as well as a, some rise of concentration, which is suggestive of firm market power increasing. Um, and, you know, in terms of our policy conclusions, we think a kind of focus on raising productivity, uh, particularly around strengthening competition and around innovation policy should be key things that uh, policymakers should, should think about. So let me first talk about uh, you know why we should look at inequality between firms. Now you know people have very good reasons for looking at inequality between uh, individuals, between families and communities, but firms are not those. You know fir firms are not households, um, so it's not so obvious that we should be so concerned about whether um, you know a, a small firm is doing worse or, or getting out of business. What matters is, is individuals, really. Um, but there are three reasons why you, you, we might care. So first of all, uh, the firm you work for is incredibly important important for your wages and well-being. And that shouldn't be a surprise to most people, but to economists, our traditional model has been it's about your own individual uh, skills and human capital, which is, the, which is what causes your, your wages. And that remains important, but there's a, a lot of evidence that for people who can work for more successful firms also um, do better in terms of the wages they share and some of the benefits. So increase in equality between firms will put in upward pressure on increase in equality between people. The second reason is that um, firm inequality can also matter for aggregate outcomes like productivity, which I've argued is one of the main drivers of long run wages. Um, so, for example, uh, if um, the, 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 the fusion, the adoption of new technologies between the leading firms and the laggard firms, the kind of less successful firms, has slowed down, um, you know, this will this will be a force for pushing down aggregate productivity growth. So that could be a reason why we might be also concerned that increasing dispersion between between firms matters for these aggregate outcomes. And finally, and more you know, social and political sense, you know, if large firms, superstar firms, are becoming more and more powerful, this may actually increase their lobbying strength to shift laws and regulations in their favour. So we talk a little bit about the chapter, not not as not as much. Uh, as, as, as we'd like to in given time. I won't be touching on that. Okay, so here is it, probably the most important graph for the, kind of, you know, for the UK, uh, I sometimes say. Uh, so this is um, a measure of aggregate productivity. This is uh, GDP per hour worked. And you can see normalized in, in the in Antonio over the last 40 years, this has increased by about 87%. But it really is a tale of, you know, not two halves, but one third and two thirds. So after the global financial crisis, there was a significant slowdown of productivity. So since 
the global financial crisis, we've had a productivity growth of something like two percentage points a year. Uh, that's a tenth of what it was in the uh, in the in the 30 years or so leading up to the global financial crisis. So that's a, a huge slowdown of productivity. And you might say, well, you know, why do we care about that? Well, we care about that because of wages. So if you look at what's happened to wages, either at the mean or the median, so the, the median is where you have 50% of people below and above you, the mean is more influenced by the kind of, you know, very highly paid individuals. So the difference is a kind of indicator of inequality. So inequality is clearly increased, but, you know, in the 80s in particular, but since the global financial crisis, really both of these things have, uh, have, have, have been very disappointing. So, you know, both mean and median pay have not really recovered, or just about recovered to where they were in before the financial crisis. And that is, a, you know, I think a major issue in terms of um, our, our kind of politics, our, our social outcomes, and also our general sense of well-being. So that is a real critical thing. Okay, so what about firms? So um, taking our kind of um, database from, um, you know, you know trying to look at almost all firms in the economy, we have uh, tracked out what's happening to productivity. So at the median firm, this is weighted by firm size. So again, there's about 50% of people above and below. You can see that it kind of tracks what's happened in aggregate productivity. So, you know, for the median firm, there was a, you know, re relatively healthy growth before the financial crisis, but, you know, real new stagnation afterwards. Whereas if we look at the top 10% of firms, so, um, you know, the work, you know, the, the kind of uh, the 10% the, 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 the of workers that work in the most productive firms, they've had pretty healthy productivity growth over this period. So something like you know, 40, 45% increase of productivity growth. So the top firms have been doing relatively well. Whereas if you look at the bottom firms, then you actually see um, a kind of fall, if anything, at the, at the bottom of the distribution. So uh, an increase of inequality between firms, particularly between the upper tail. So different data sets can give you different exact managers, but every data set I've seen has seen a very clear evidence of the superstar firms, the best firms pulling away from, from the middle of, middle of the pack. Okay, so that's productivity. But what about wages? So if you look at wages, average wages in these, these firms, you actually see a, a relative similar pattern. So not as big a change in magnitude, but the qualitative pattern is extremely similar, where the kind of, you know, there's relatively small gains for people at the median firm, large gains for people at the top, and if anything, some falls for the, some of the firms at the bottom. So the kind of distribution of productivity of, of wages across firms is kind of gone uh, in tandem with what's happened to uh, productivity changes. Okay, so that's the that's the kind of um, that's that's one of the important stylized facts we kind of see in 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 the in the chapter. So interestingly, if we compare this with the U.S., it's actually very similar. If you look at U.S. data, we both see um, not as dramatically as the U.K. a, a slowdown in aggregate productivity growth, a slowdown in aggregate wage growth since the global financial crisis. The stagnation of U.S. wages has actually gone on for a longer period of time, as some of the chapters show. Um, we also see this increase of dispersion of wages or, or productivity across firms. Uh, so the other kind of things that we noticed in the US, I'm sure Jan Ekout will talk about this, is what's been happening to the markup and, uh, and the labor share. And if you look at the aggregate markup, for example, and this has been shown by, uh, by uh, my co-author, Jan Deloka and Jan Ekout, these have also been increasing. So this is the ability to, of firms to price above uh, measures of the variable costs. Um, and we can, we'll get into whether that shows you have, they have an overall increase of the profitability because it doesn't include fixed costs and it's harder to measure. But it does suggest that there is some potential increase uh, strength of, uh, of the product market power firms in the UK. If you look at the uh, labour share, um, there is also some fall of the labour share. So, um, you know, the wage share has fallen by maybe something like three percentage points over this 40 year period. Um, this is not as uh, large as it is in the US. Um, and, you know, the fall actually you know, happened uh, in the 80s rather than in, in the kind of, you know, more recent periods. So there has been some fall, but not as large as, as there has been in the United States. But broadly, the qualitative picture in the UK and the US is, is, quite, is, is quite similar. And in the, in the chapter, we also talk about some other measures like entrepreneurship and, and firm size, which I won't have time to talk about. But there's a lot of similarity between the UK and the US in, uh, you know, at least in the qualitative picture. So what might be going on here? Um, what, what kind of 
uh, things might explain this. Well, there's kind of three broad classes of explanation. I don't think anybody knows that the full answer to these, but let me just put them on the table for discussion. So one set of stories is around institutional changes. So particularly in the United States, people have argued that there has been a weakening in the enforcement of competition policy that has enabled um, powerful firms to become more powerful, to lax merger regime, to lax um, ways of trying to stop dominant firms becoming more powerful. Um, a second set of arguments is around technological changes. Um, so one set of stories around there is that in some of the industries, especially digital industries, you have these network effects. So kind of success begets success. Um, and, you know, you think about, I call this Google effect. Sometimes you think about search engines. You get an advantage of people searching uh, in a search engine. The, uh, Google gets more information about you, improves its search engine again, and it shifts the whole market towards Google. Towards uh, search engines, Google in this case. So these network effects are, can be very important in creating kind of winner take winner takes all effects of markets. Um, but because we've seen this not just in the high tech industries, we've seen these patterns happening in other industries, in many other industries like um, retail. I, I think that it's, that can't be the whole story. So another kind of um, aspect of this technology story could be that there's been an increase of importance of uh, fixed costs, especially around intangible capital like software. So I sometimes think call these Tesco or Walmart effects. So if you think about why these uh, type of uh, supermarkets have become so successful, part of it is because they can make these enormous investments in software, which enables them to track um, goods flowing through the product, through the kind of supply chains, having just in time um, uh, inventory control and those kind of um, you know million tens hundreds of millions of investments can't be emulated by smaller chains or even you know, small independent stores. So this kind of gives an advantage to the kind of larger firms. A third reason is that maybe this, as I mentioned at the beginning, the slowdown of technology diffusion from superstar uh, larger firms to to followers. Um, maybe that might be deliberate strategies of the larger firms through intellectual property protection. Maybe that's something to do about the way that ideas flow through the economy, but that's the third possible explanation. And the final class of explanations might be to the globalization. This may have also created when it take all type of effects by product markets. It may mean that multinationals are particularly able to uh, move things around their global value chains and input markets to, to, earn, to, earn, to earn higher profits and have these the, the success. So these are all possible explanations. I think different things are probably happening in different markets. Um, one thing that we do that is quite striking because I think many of these things have happened like in the UK and the US and many other countries. It suggests to me that, you know, the purely institutional stories are unlikely to be the whole explanation. I, I, I think that, you know, I don't think that the, um, the enforcement of competition policy has fallen so much in, in the UK as it may have done in the US. So I think these more technological stories are more likely to be the, the, the primary driving forces of, uh, of, of what's going on. Uh, a second thing, you know, the fact that the labor share in the UK hasn't fallen as much in the US, despite the upward trend of the markup, um, that also does suggest a role for some role for institutions. So particularly if you think about the minimum wage, which was introduced in the mid nineties in the late nineties in the UK and was uprated, this may have been a kind of offsetting force to the kind of uh, downward pressure uh, on the labor share of GDP due to the increase of uh, on market power of firms. And we, we talk about that a bit in the paper. So let me conclude with one or two thoughts on policy. Um, first of all, you know, as I've argued, the slow pay growth that we've seen in the UK since 2008, uh, you know, which is, I think, one of our major economic problems, or not the major economic problem, I, I think is linked to the slow productivity growth, uh, rather than the, uh, you know, dominated by the fall of labour sure growing wage inequality. Um, and so I think to address that, one of the things that we need to think about doing is raising productivity through long-term investments, innovation, skills, and infrastructure, addressing some of the uh, policy attention deficit disorder that I've argued in the LSE Growth Commission is an issue of creating greater uncertainty, and also thinking about how to diffuse technologies faster, both the hard technologies, you know, digital technology, and also the kind of things with management practices more quickly through the economy to raise productivity. Secondly, you know, even if we think that the success of many superstar firms is because mainly because of technology innovation, there is still risk of um, abusing market dominance. So even if you've got to be very powerful through um, you know, market forces rather than by rigging the system, I still think that obviously means that you have potentially the ability to do things which 
may uh, be harmful to workers and consumers. So we need to think about modernizing competition policy in a winner's take all world. And we, I'm sure Jean will get into this in, in, in the discussion we have. And then finally, I, I do think institutions are important. So I think there has been some countervailing um, forces like the minimum wage, which has been helpful in terms of uh, you know, keeping inequality under control uh, in the labor market. So I think we need to think about um, re other regulatory changes, um, and say particularly around when we think about things around the gig economy, how we make sure that we have good standards uh, for workers, that, those type of sectors. Okay, so thank you very much, and I will hand over to Jan. Thank you, John. Let me share my screen. Thank you, John. And I first I want to say that this is a, a, a quite an impressive chapter uh, dealing with these issues on on, on firms uh, for two reasons. One, because it's using you know kind of data that are are very comprehensive and gives a really uh, in depth view of, uh, of of what goes on in on the firm side in, in the UK. And second, as John was stressing, the the relationship between what's going on in the US uh, compared to to uh, to the UK. And, and the main conclusion is really that, you know, the conclusion is that the UK is very much like the US. As John was saying, we don't really care about inequality between firms per se. We care really about inequality of households. And, and it's important to stress this because sometimes it may be better to have inequality between firms. I mean, if you think about, you know, electricity utilities, it makes sense to have large firms because there's really an importance of scale and that's the efficient way to produce. And many technologies also today, digital technologies, there's, there's an important dimension of scale that really makes them valuable. And so, you know, having inequality between firms per se should not be a reason for concern. We should worry about inequality between households. But why do we nonetheless worry about inequality between firms is because there are different mechanisms that I'm going to focus on, on, on market power here, how, you know, firm inequality basically leads to market power. It could be because of technology. It could be for different reasons, but that market power then has implications for inequality for workers and therefore uh, of households. And so, as I said, what uh, I, I really like about this, this chapter is, is the detailed uh, analysis of the, 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 the firm panorama, if you want, in, in the UK. And we come to the conclusion, or they come to the conclusion, that this is very similar to what's going on in the US, both on the firm side, but also on these consequences, microeconomic consequences, the economy-wide consequences, if you want, that we see as a result of these, these inequalities between firms. And let me just summarize John's point, because I'm going to add one, but just say first, well, we see this in markups and profit rates. If you want, we see both an increase in these average measures of market that um, John showed, and we see also an increase in dispersion. And that's very important. I'm going to come back to that. The same thing with the firm size distribution. We see that firm size uh, tends to, to shift upwards. But there's again, the main thing is that there's a, an increase in this dispersion between firm sizes. This idea of the labor share declining and the dispersion going up, as John uh, showed, and then there's the closely related, of course, the, the wages that stagnate. But again, also there's this, this wage inequality that's uh, uh, rising. John put a lot of uh, uh, emphasis on, on the productivity slowdown and, and its dispersion. So again, we see that also in, in, in the US. And then finally, there's something that's often uh, overlooked, which is that uh, when we talk about market power going up and the dominance of firms, that also has implications for other firms. And that means, for example, smaller firms and startup firms, we've seen a, a decline. I'm going to show you some data uh, for, for the US to just compare. And then this notion of business dynamism in the sense of how you know, uh, liquid, if you want, this, this, this labor market is, how, how much turnover there is within firms, which basically has implications for social mobility through promotions and other uh, within the firms. I want to add one fact that I'm going to show you in a little bit, which is the labor force participation, the decline in labor force participation, because I, I think it's very important in terms of the social cost of, uh, or measuring the social cost of, of this uh, change in, in firm inequalities. So, this, the sources of inequality that are due to market power giving kind of can be understood in, in four different categories. And this is a very broad brush uh, way of looking at it. Of course, if you increase profits because firm has market power, less can go to labor income. I mean, there must, it must come from somewhere. 
But we also see in the data that there is not only that division, we also see second that there's inequality between the workers, that the wage inequality is going up. Now that could be purely technology, as John was referring to the fact that you know our, our productivity, our skills, our ability determine how productive we are. But we see, and I'm going to show you some evidence about uh, changes in the profit sharing at the top, and that's basically leading to enormous changes in inequality in wages at the very top. We know from work by uh, Piketty and size that much of the increase in wage inequality is really coming from the very top. And we, sh we find that, that inequality is, is very much uh, uh, going up by, you know, say, managers, CEOs, if you want, but also much lower level managers. And this is driven by profit sharing of these, these uh, uh, wage earners at the top. The third way to look at these inequalities is, in fact, inequalities between entrepreneurs. I talked about startups and smaller firms. So a, a lot of what's going on is that many of these dominant firms squeeze their suppliers, for example. So they not only exert market power on their customers, but they also exert market power upstream by squeezing their uh, input providers, which is a form of monopsony. We have monopsony in the labor market, but we have also very much monopsony, monopsony in these, these uh, input markets. And, and, and it's, it seems to be the case that there's, you know, you, you see, say, an Amazon squeezing all its delivery companies, the ones that actually do uh, run around with the vans and the trucks and, and, and that they manage, you know, to exert so much power over these companies that they can, they can squeeze these smaller uh, entrepreneurs. And then finally, we shouldn't forget that, of course, profits are concentrated and this leads to wealth inequality. And it's basically another source of inequality that follows from this, this concentration of uh, power. So this is very similar. The first, the, the picture on the left is very similar to what John showed in terms of what happens to the, the markups. Um, on the right, what I show is basically the average profit rate. So the markups are only really priced to cost in terms of variable cost. The profit rates take into account also fixed cost. And John has talked about this being uh, very important. And we see a substantial change going on, even though it's dropped after the Great Recession. In, in, in any event, it's going up from 1% to 7%, then dropping back to, to, to 5%. Very important to know, this is at averages. So a small fraction of firms are really driving this. The median markup and the median profit rate is actually falling. So there's at least half of the firms that have lower markups and lower profits. And everything that you see in these averages is driven by a small number of dominant firms. It's really driven by this 90th percentile. And you can see that there's not only in this market power story, a conflict between workers and firms, but there's also a, a, a conflict between these different uh, firms in the distribution. And I should also say this is across all sectors. This is not just in tech, although tech seems to have an important role. Other people have done research recently showing that even if you see in a traditional sector as textiles, for example, uh, a firm that exerts market power and has increasing markups, has increasing profit rates, um, what happens is very often that these firms extensively uh, uh, or intensively rather em employ uh, new technologies, uh, uh, digital technologies. This is on, on startups. This is data for the US. Uh, um, but basically, the startup and this business dynamism, the fact that, you know, until the, the, the late 70s, early 80s, about 14% of all firms were new firms. Okay, and this is basically new firms, which are, as, as I like to call it, the building blocks of the economy, because they tend to grow faster. They tend to hire more workers, typically more young workers, and they tend to innovate more. And that percentage of these young new firms has fallen from 14% to under 8%. Okay, and this related to that is this job reallocation rate, which measures business dynamism, which is how fast firms turn over their uh, uh, their labor force, and that has fallen from 35 to 25%. And you can link that directly to the market power of firms. Why? Because the more market power firms have, the less they transmit or pass through shocks that they see in the economy, maybe to the, to, due to demand or through uh, uh, kind of shocks to their, their costs. They pass less of that through to their prices and therefore also to the quantities that they produce and therefore also to the number of workers that they hire. Now, this is kind of this job reallocation rate. The startup rate is, uh, is, is depressed because these dominant firms either manage to uh, 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 kind of thwart that competition of these new startups or something like on a less 
benevolent in a less benevolent way like these killer acquisitions uh, that uh, we, we see evidence of. So what is the mechanism from, from market power through wages? And I'm going to kind of come back to, to a, a different mechanism in, in, in the next slide. But basically, we, we, we think of this as, as, as John has pointed out, productivity differences and new technologies seem to play an important role. In the digital age, we seem to uh, have an important sort of a key role for scale economies and network effects. Okay? And this creates permanent kind of productivity advantages which create natural monopolies. And you can think of this as, well, we saw this in, say, 1900. We had a new, new technologies back then too. It was electricity provision, it was uh, rail travel, it was uh, oil exploration, it was uh, telephone and telegraph. And that back then also led to scale economies because you know still electricity provision is very much a scale economy uh, uh, sector. And these natural monopolies have since then been regulated. We see something very similar. The thing is, the key is that you know, these sectors today is they're not really the Schumpeterian creative destruction uh, advantages that firms have because under Schumpeterian creative destruction, such advantages are temporary. And it seems that many of these network effects and scale economies are there to stay, they're permanent. And that's really where this permanent advantage comes from of uh, these firms. So new technology is both kind of the hero and the villain of the movie here, the hero because they create innovation and new technology, but at the same time the villain because they manage to create also the ability for these firms to set up barriers to entry and to ex uh, exert this natural monopoly position that they have. And so what happens is you set higher prices. That means that your consumption and production goes down and your demand for labor and, and wages is going to fall because you have less production, so you produce less and therefore your wages are going to fall. And you know, for small firms, that means, of course, lower profits because they can't get into these markets and either they're going to be taken over or there's going to be these killer acquisitions that lead to, to, to this. John talked a lot about the productivity slowdown. This productivity slowdown is less so in the United States. This is data for the United States, but there's something else that's going on at the same time, which is that you know wages don't just fall because productivity slows down, but wages also you know there's a wedge that's being created between whatever the productivity is and the wages that they pay if there is a higher uh, extent of market power of, of these dominant firms. And that's exactly what I was uh, trying to, to uh, explain in the, in, in the last uh, slide that by saying, you know, you have this market mechanism that higher prices by a, a number of dominant firms leads to a decline in labor demand and this basically depresses uh, the wages. Now you might ask how much of that could be due to monopsony? How much of that could be due to the fact that one individual firm exerts market power over its own workers? Because most people wouldn't would say that it's not the problem that Google is paying too badly uh, its workforce. In fact, it would be the opposite. So most of these dominant firms actually, you know, play, pay fairly high wages. But the, the issue is that because there's many of these dominant firms who have demand for services that are not directly their own goods that they produce, which has basically an, an effect economy-wide. And we see that the monopsony effect, which is there, is about one-third of this wage productivity gap. The monopoly effect or the market power effect through the kind of, if you want, the, the, the effect through wages and prices is about two-thirds, but all of the increase is coming through this monopoly effect, not from, from a monopsony effect. And this is consistent with what John was saying, that in, in the UK in particular, kind of responses, institutional responses to offset this monopsony effect through minimum wages, for example, has, has managed to keep that gap uh, uh, closed. Then I mentioned earlier, at the top of the distribution, you see wage inequality, particularly where it has grown most. And let me show you some evidence on, on manager pay. This is for a sample of international firms. So that's not just the UK, it also include the, includes the US. And what we see is since the, the, the 40s in, in red, you see the evolution of, of manager pay. And since mainly the, the, the late 70s, this manager pay has been rising uh, substantially. But at the same period, we also see this rise since the 1980s of these markups, of this, this, this dominance. And you might say, well, this is purely a correlation. When we look deeper at this, what is going on is that really for these top managers, managers also not just pay for being more productive, they're being paid because they create profits through market power. 
And we find that on, on average, 52% of the pay is due to market power today. And there's a, a substantial increase going on there. It was only 38% in, in the, uh, 1994. We have the micro, micro data to measure it. But what has happened is that the, the component of this market power in manager pay has increased and it's now more than half. And this seems to suggest that something's going on at the top of the distribution where these top workers, and this could be a manager, but it could also be a programmer who works for Facebook, they share in some of these rents that they generate from this dominant position. Why? Because if I'm a coder at Facebook and I change something that's going to have you know, an implication for 2 billion users, this is extremely valuable. And these firms are trying to attract really the best of these you know, top uh, uh, coders or top managers to to generate these, uh, uh, these this value. But notice that this is not just creating value in terms of being more productive; it's creating more a more dominant position. And notice that the higher the type of the manager is, the more uh, of, of you get towards the top managers. This getting to eighty eight percent. So this is this is becoming even more uh, dominant. So wage inequality at the very top seems to be very much driven by, uh, in part, this, uh, this, this dominant position of these firms. Okay, um, something's going wrong with my slide here. Um, so let me just, uh, uh, um, let, let, let me just talk. I, I was going to show you the, the, the decline in, in uh, labor force participation. Basically, one of the points that, that John hasn't talked about, and this is, I think, an, an, an important uh, uh, um, kind of aspect to, to measure the social cost of this market power, is that as a result of these stagnating wages, what we see is, of course, that with upward slope in labor supply, basically fewer workers are going to go enter into the labor force. And what's happening with this uh, increase in, in, sorry, this decline in wages, we see basically a decline in labor force participation, it's declining by about uh, four or five percentage points, which is substantial. And even for females the, whose labor force participation has, has increased until the late 90s, just because of the structural change that females have entered massively into the labor force, since the late 90s, even for the females, labor force participation has started to decline. And the reason why that is, is we see this wage stagnation compared to productivity. So more people just don't find it, you know, attractive to enter the labor market. They'd rather maybe uh, uh, do some work at home or if they have a spouse who's, uh, who has a high enough uh, uh, salary, they'd rather stay at home and, and look after the kids. So if my wife earns enough, I might rather stay at home than have this, uh, this low wage. And we see that this is the main driver of the social cost of this market power, because ultimately the distribution, the inequality we get from going, you know, wages towards profits is a redistribution. It doesn't affect efficiency, but the efficiency is mainly driven from this uh, fall in labor participation, which reflects ultimately this dead weight loss from the higher uh, prices. Okay, so my slides are uh, uh, really. Uh, uh, I'm going to try one thing. Uh, this, I apologize for this. Well, I can't do it. So uh, let me just conclude. The one thing I wanted to say in terms of policy, which is, is very much on, on the uh, uh, along the line of what John was saying earlier, is the following: that as you know, we think about policy. One of the things that we have to be very careful about is is what we want to do. And I think that the main uh, uh, answer, the main solution, is is coming from uh, having more competition. If you have more competition, what this is going to do is it's going to lead to um, basically, you know, at the root cause, trying to address this issue of, of having this dominant position. Now, this is not easy. We can think about, you know, having antitrust authorities not doing their job, but I think it's very much a technological change which requires uh, uh, thinking carefully, just as we did, you know, a century ago about uh, uh, utilities like electricity provision, how we can get more competition. One of them has to do with separating networks from the providers. If you think about you know, this notion of interoperability, which is one of the issues that uh, 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 people in, 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 in IT and in tech have talked about for, for a long time, is, is one way to separate the network which creates the scale advantages, which is really where the value of the new technology is coming from, from who is operating on this network, who is being active. And it's, 
it's it, I think there is a lot of regulation that allows you to do that. The problem is, do we have the the policy tools uh, uh, to to implement it? And and there we face a vicious circle of uh, uh, influence of these large firms in the policy process because market power creates profits. And profits creates the means to do lobbying, which in turn allows them to obtain favorable regulation for these firms, which in turn gives more market power. And that vicious circle is probably the biggest obstacle to regulation in these markets, where uh, uh, very often there are tools that we know that work, but uh, would be you know they're going to be kind of political uh, impediments to to implement them. Um, I'm going to leave it here. I'm going to pass on uh, now to Rachel. Uh, Who's next? Thank you. Thanks very much, Jan. Uh, so, in the chapter that I've uh, written with Philippe Aguillon, we um, try and sort of step back a little bit from the really excellent, detailed work that both um, John and Jan have talked about. Um, Jan, do you want to put yourself on, on mute and turn your camera off? Um, that, that John and Jan have talked about uh, and provide a little bit more of the overall all context. Um, of the impact of innovation on inequality, and importantly, on the impact of inequality on innovation. So, so let me just start with a couple of broad comments. And I, I see in Slido that the current most popular question is about public sector innovation. Uh, and so that's an interesting question, and one at which I'm afraid I'm only going to have one bullet point, because um, so, if, so if we look in the UK, around one third of innovation expenditure uh, is by the public sector. About two thirds is about is by the private sector, which is what we've entirely been talking about. So what's the impact of that public sector innovation on, in, on inequalities? Um, it, there's really not that much literature on. We actually had a little search to try and see that. I think if we think that, that um, UK policy is largely redistributive, then I guess that innovation that is making that more effective will largely be um, inequality reducing. And I think particularly if we think as the Deaton Review is doing about a broader set of, in, of inequalities, not just income inequality, which we've been talking about, but inequalities in access to the judicial system or uh, access to education, then of course that public sector expenditure may well do quite a lot to reduce those types of inequalities. But that is a really excellent question. What does innovation in the public sector do to a broad set of inequalities, uh, about our, um, which I'm afraid we're going to say uh, next to nothing about? And like John and Yan, I'm going to shift immediately to talking about the two thirds of innovation activity that's undertaken in the private sector and really talk about the impact of firm level innovation on income inequality. And that, that's really been the focus of these several chapters. So innovation affects inequalities in many ways, and I'm just going to try and provide uh, but both increasing it and decreasing it. And that really, you know, the effect it has really crucially depends on who controls the property rights to the innovation and how they exploit it. And so I'm going to try and just give some really broad overview of some of those effects from a sort of broader literature, putting in context the work that the really great work that John and, and Jan have talked about. So this is less representing new work, but just kind of uh, talking about some, some of uh, what we know. So if we think about the impact of firm level innovation on inequality or private sector innovation on inequality, on the one hand, innovation typically increases top income inequality because it generates economic profits for a small number of people who are the owners who control the property rights of the invention. On the other hand, to the extent that innovation create is involved with creative destruction, so to the extent that it is new firms coming in with new ideas and new technologies, that new ent entrants are coming in and replacing old incumbent firms, it increases social mobility. So, for example, if we look across um, US states, we see that there's a really strong correlation between the top 1% income share with innovation. And work by Philippe, uh, Richard Blundell and others has shown that that correlation reflects a causal effect, that innovation has caused an increase in top income inequality. However, they also show that it's had an important role to play in fostering social mobility. 
So social mobility is a dynamic measure of, of income inequality. And it's basically the correlation between your parents' income and a child's income. And to the extent that innovation enables people who were from lower income backgrounds to come up with new ideas and, and be, you know, replace incumbents, then that increase in social mobility reduces inequality. Of course, it creates new incumbents potentially, and that's a lot of what we've been talking about is how you then uh, have a policy environment that continually fosters that creative destruction. Um, so also talking about a very broad set of literature, what we know from a very broad set of literature, actually much of which John has contributed to people like David Autor, we know that new technologies tend to benefit high-skilled workers. New technologies tend to replace routine jobs of low-skilled workers and to make high-skilled workers more productive. And as John emphasized, inequalities in productivities between firms, particularly the growth of superstar firms, may be important in driving inequalities in income between workers, workers who get to work, who get to match to high productive firms or high profitable firms, will get higher wages than those who end up in the lower productivity, lower profitability firms. However, recent evidence suggests that um, innovative firms may also benefit some kinds of low skilled workers, and particularly in combination with targeted policies, has the potential to foster wage growth amongst low skilled workers. So in work that I've been doing with Philippe and Richard, we show that innovative firms create more good jobs for low educated workers where a good job is one that offers people, low educated workers, favorable prospects for tenure, for long tenure, pay progression um, and promotion within the firm. And that's only gonna be the case where there's the potential for that wor worker's marginal contribution to the firm's performance, so their marginal product, to increase over time. And we show that some particular sets of skills and particular soft skills are increasingly playing an important role in that. And so we can think about the way that policy can enable and ensure that workers gain the appropriate skills. And I'll come back to that, but this is very compatible with thinking about the, the current leveling up agenda in the UK. So the impact of innovation and inequality you know, is, is two ways. So in one, on the one hand, it increases top incomes, so it increases inequality. On the other hand, to the extent that it uh, represents in creative destruction or entrance coming in and um, crowding out, overtaking over from uh, incumbents, it, it may uh, foster, um, reduce inequalities. But there are some important caveats, a lot of which John and Jan have been, just been talking about. So you know, innovation can promote social mobility, um, but yesterday's inventors become entrenched incumbents. And so it's very important that we have a policy environment that tries to um, encourage new entry and prevents innovators from becoming good, gaining this dominant position. And John and Jan both talked about some specifics of competition policy. It's really important that competition policy is modernized um, in ways that don't allow these superstar firms to become dominant and, uh, and crowd out potential new entry. Um, the other important thing, again, which draws on work that, that John has done and others, uh, Philippe and others, is that not everyone, in, when we think about entry, not everyone has an equal opportunity of becoming an in inventor. So as well as innovation affecting inequality, inequality may affect who can become an innovator. innovator. Parental income, parental education, and other characteristics of one's parents may play an important role in the ability for individuals to become inventors. So the fostering of this social mobility and creative destruction. Um, so the probability of becoming an inventor increases with parental income, partly because per richer parents tend to be more educated, but partly also because the parental education may be like a direct input into a child's education and aspirations in life uh, and, and their sort of, you know, uh, thinking about the possibilities for them to become an inventor may also be important in a financial sense in that wealthy parents may provide important capital, initial capital to children to, um, to, to engage in risky inventive activities. 
So just to sort of wrap up um, the, you know, overall, when we think about the, we've talked a lot about what might sound like the problematic aspects of innovation in terms of increasing income inequalities. However, it's really important to remember that innovation ultimately does increase productivity and so enable the possibility for, um, of, of enable, increase economic wealth and so enable the possibility of more redistributive policies. So it's really important that it's a private sector innovation without policy in, in, in event, intervention will probably increase income inequalities. There's a broad set of policies which are both important and have the ability to work together with private sector innovation to reduce those income inequalities and to foster equality of opportunity. You know, our aim is not to reduce income inequalities to zero, but to have a sort of fair income inequality, if you want to put it that way. So John and Jan have also talked a lot about competition policy, and I see there's some questions about the specifics of that. Of course, that's going to be very complicated and difficult, but very worth thinking about. It's also worth thinking about technology policies that encourage diffusion, so don't allow incumbents to become so entrenched by having uh, exclusive access to particular new technologies. Training and education policy, John mentioned some labor market policies like minimum wages. In addition, thinking of training and education policies that enable, for example, relatively low educated workers to develop the skills that are valued by high quality firms that, that are productivity enhancing and so enable them to get into those new jobs. And policies that tackle financial market failures to ease entry into uh, and in creative destruction, so encourage social mobility for people from low educated backgrounds. So I'll stop there to uh, leave John enough time to talk and, and must have time for questions. So John, I'll hand over to you. Okay, well, thanks so much, Rachel, and uh, thanks for having me. This is really a dream team, uh, John, Jan, and, and Rachel. So I don't have a huge amount to add, but I'm going to share a few thoughts with you. Um, so let me share this. Okay, so a couple of remarks on, um, on those very interesting chapters and, and commentaries. Uh, the first question was already uh, handled by John in particular. Why do we care? I mean, when we think about industrial structure in general, we think about um, inefficiency, so market power, maybe fewer startups, uh, lobbying and the like, but we don't usually think in terms of inequality. Uh, nonetheless, um, it's important for inequality as well. Uh, there are inequalities among workers with similar qualifications. Uh, they work with different employers and therefore get very different wages and well-being. Uh, there are the issue of superstar workers versus the rest. Uh, there is the issue of capital versus labor. Um, and on the latter, uh, there is a question of supranormal profits. And that's, of course, something which is uh, very hard to determine. I'll come back uh, on that to that later on when I discuss the ability to regulate those industries. Um, the interventions suggested in the chapter and the commentaries um, are, I think, very well taken. Uh, increasing human capital, especially in the bottom of the distribution or the middle of the distribution. We all know that our societies are not merit meritocratic at all, and we, we must improve that a lot. Um, innovation is very important. I guess we'll come back to that in the chat, in the discussion, the Q&A. Um, that raises the issue of uh, industrial policy. Industrial policy is, is both the best and the worst thing. If it's done poorly, as it often is, it's a complete, wa complete waste of public money, but it can be a very nice thing too, and, and, and there are rules on how to do it. Um, labor market intervention, of course, social security for independent workers, uh, minimum wage when the minimum wage is, uh, is low. Uh, and competition policy, and I will come back to that because it's, of course, a, a difficult issue. Um, the chapter documents very useful facts for the UK, um, very similar to the US, um, but we didn't know it for the UK. Uh, stagnant productivity and, and wages, 
the fall in the labor share, a little bit less than the US, but of course there is also less manufacturing. And of course the labor share has fallen more uh, in manufacturing an increase in markups an increase in firm size and all of that being closely linked to superstar firms. Now the question is, why do we have that? And, and the chapter and the commentaries goes through that. Uh, one aspect is of course institutions, um, you know, labor market institutions, competition policy and the like. Then there is of course a big evolution in terms of technology in the last 30 years, also in terms of globalization. And all those things are interdependent, of course, because globalization technologies also determine what kind of institutions we can have. Um, I think uh, that technology and globalization may be bigger, but at the same time, if you think about what we can do, which is policy, then obviously one the institution is, of course, more important. Um, I don't think we are going to change that much to globalization, maybe a bit, but it's not it's not the main lever of action. Um, let me come to regulation. Um, now, as Jan, I think, uh, already explained, we move, uh, we, we have economies with very large fixed or sunk cost. And in that sense, they resemble with a vengeance, you know, the standard utilities, uh, you know, telecom, electricity, railroads, Actually, the marginal cost is often close to zero or zero. Um, so that suggests we should go for regulation. Uh, but I would argue that regulation, either cost of service or you know, its improvement, the performance-based regulation, is pretty hard to implement here. And just to convince yourself of that, think about the notion of cost recovery. So usually in, in utilities, you recover your costs through pricing, which is regulated, uh, but you first have to define, you know, you, you have to define revenue. Um, and the question um, is a measurement issue. Uh, the, big, the big innovation, of course, for <laughs> relative to public utilities is that tech companies are global firms. All the utilities have been national. So it's, you know, and you have international transfer pricing, which makes it hard to know what revenue to get in each country. Um, and there is a coordination issue among regulators of different countries. But also it's very difficult to measure the rate base, the capital which has been invested. Now, in, in terms of, um, of digital economy, uh, the capital is in part data today. It's very, very hard to value. It's a big investment, so, and uh, it's very hard to value. But there is also, I'm not saying it's impossible to do, but you know, it's, 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 it's not like you're buying a, an electricity plant. There you know the number of, of pounds which have been spent on that. Um, the tech firm's investments are not monitored along their life cycle. Um, and that's a big issue. I mean, it's not, again, it's not like a telecom company or, or an electricity company or a railroad company. Um, and in a sense, you have to ask yourself, uh, how much money do you have to pay to the ne next Google in order to create an entry uh, of a Google rival? And that raises the issue of uh, ex ante profitability. So you have to ask yourself, what is the probability that this firm will succeed in, you know, exposed, will have succeeded in becoming the new Google? And that's a completely unobserved uh, probability of success. Uh, it's, so it's pretty hard to regulate as a public utility. The alternatives, of course, and one of the alternatives is uh, uh, breakup. So uh, basically, we cut uh, Facebook or Google or Amazon or uh, et cetera into pieces. Um, now, I think there are differences again with the, I'm not against it by the way, but I want to, to see a plan and I haven't seen any convincing plan uh, so far. Um, you know, breaking up at and or electricity companies or railroad companies was not easy. It took a few years, but at least there, were, there was a relatively clear bottleneck. So, you know, for example, the electricity uh, high voltage grid for, uh, for electricity system or for railroads, those are the, st the station and the tracks. 
Um, now, you know, that was a technology which hasn't changed for a century. Uh, but now we have technologies which evolve very rapidly. And you have to ask yourself, can I keep on breaking up the firms, you know, as the technology evolves? Uh, the other point uh, I want to make is that, you know, since you have to um, identify the essential facility or the bottleneck, you have to be able to unscramble the eggs. And it's much easier to prevent the eggs from being scrambled than to unscramble them, uh, as is well known. Um, and you know, once you have added mergers and those firms have, have, have put together all their data and processes and, and investment, it becomes pretty hard to unscramble. So I, I will adopt more an ex-ante perspective than an exposed perspective. Um, again, I'm not against it, but I, I just want to see a clean plan. Uh, my gut feeling at this stage is that competition policy and consumer protection uh, are really the main game in town, but they have to be changed uh, to make them more agile. Um, and actually, that's what many, re many uh, countries have proposed, including the UK, uh, some kind of large, I mean, there are lots of different names, but basically a competition policy plus um with some firms which are conferred a strategic uh, market status um, with a little bit of regulation um, put into into competition policy so it will be sectoral also i don't like this word because uh, it's hard to know what tech companies in which industry tech companies belong to um, but it will be more forward looking than competition authorities so they will collect information about those firms along the way to be able to react faster. They will have the ability to suspend decisions some enforcement power, subject to court review, of course. Um, and they will monitor the you know, defensive acquisitions. So those firms will have to pre-notify their acquisition and the burden of proof to show efficiency. Uh, efficiency gain will be on, on, their, on their side. So basically, you know, it's pretty hard to prove that uh, that that Facebook was acquiring uh, Instagram and WhatsApp on the basis of uh, defensive acquisition uh, for multiple reasons, including that the market share was was close to zero for the latter. Um, we have to change this kind of system, and then just like competition authority today, we have to aim at preserving contestability. So. Uh, you have to prevent exclusive, exclusivity requirements uh, by dominant platforms because it's very important for entrants to have mem to have users who are multi-homing. Uh, you want to enforce fair access uh, by dominant platforms, uh, so that, that's of, of course very important. We, you may have to regulate actually the fees charged to the merchants uh, by, by, by the platforms as well. Um, of course, you know, we, we haven't solved all questions, so you, uh, it doesn't cover abuses uh, also committed by small firms like uh, best price guarantees. Um, that does not, the abuses there have nothing to do with the size of the firm. Um, why focus just on digital firms? Uh, where should this agency be located? You know, in my view, it, it should be located within the competition authority, but that you know that can be the object of a debate and you know we have to discuss that um so those are my remarks and um, and i'm going to stop showing but uh, thanks so much well thank you um to all of you i mean i really do think that's one of the best uh, best webinars i've sat through in a very uh, very long time very full of um information and food for thought and that's very much reflected in the um the very large number of questions that we've got um uh, that we've got in slido um uh it's quite hard to know where to start so i will start at the at the top rachel mentioned that um uh she's focused very much on the private sector as uh, as i think of the other speakers but there is a there's a, there's a very popular question here which is what about the public sector 
Um, it may be that none of you um, can add very much to that, but I, I will throw that open to any of you who'd like to come in and say, is there anything that we can add about um, productivity in the public sector and what effect um, uh, that might have? Shall I, John, yes, do you please. want to go first? Or, I mean, I, I, said, I had a couple of thoughts on this. I, I thought, you know, it's a great question. There's a narrow, just a narrow question on the numbers I put up on the increase of productivity dispersion and the other measures. We deliberately decided to exclude um, the public sector and, and industries closely related to the public sector just because it's so hard to measure as, as the, I think as the questions were saying, how do you measure productivity in the public sector? So we, for that reason, and, and some of the things we, we deliberately focused on, on the, on the private sector, what, what we do know about the public sector though, I think, you know, from work, I mean, I, I spent a year of my life working in the national health service uh, advising the, uh, the Secretary of State. And, you know, for example, there's huge variation in the cross section at a point of time in the performance across different hospitals and, and, and uh, healthcare delivery systems. So I think there are, you know, a lot of the messages in terms of how to spread better practice. Uh, you know, in a more efficient way to get the the kind of the, the underperformers up to the top is really important to the public sector. And there's ways to do this through management and technology and other kinds of mechanisms, including, I think, some some methods of competition. So I, I don't think we know how that's changed so much over time, but we do know that many the, there are many potential levers we can do to, to, to improve productivity in the public sector. And in terms of innovation of policy, I think, you know, there are lots of policy innovations that we could, we can think of and we've been discussing, which is really important for the public sector. I think we need to evaluate them, you know, R&D in the public sector to find out what works. And I think we also need to uh, create institutions, especially in the British public sector, which are attempt to reduce some of the uncertainty that we have. There's so much chopping and changing of policies, which I think is a particular problem for long run investments around infrastructure and innovation and skills, which I think is a really major problem. So in terms of making investments in, you know, think about green technologies or energy when policy is changing so much, is very hard unless you have institutions which are, are kind of built to last. So we have successes of those like the Bank of England and the Competition Markets Authority, we need more of those in order to do that from the parts of the public sector, in my view. Well, maybe I fully agree with John, and I would like to just focus on a specific issue, which is industrial policy, uh, because it's, it's, uh, it's becoming popular again, and, uh, and it's all about governance. So if you think about it, we, what we need is to have a well-done industrial policy, it's part of the infrastructure that the government provides. I mean, there's a legal infrastructure, there are all kinds of other infrastructure, and knowledge is another infrastructure which is absolutely crucial for the private sector because lots of the innovations actually come from the public sector to start with, and then they are improved by the, the private sector. But if you think about good governance, surprisingly, it often comes from the US. <laughs> Uh, you will not think the industrial policy comes from the US, but if you think about uh, all the innovation that came from DARPA and all the variants of DARPA, uh, if you think about the NIH and, and so on, uh, there are lots of the innovation that have actually uh, fueled what has happened in, uh, in Kendall Square or in uh, Silicon Valley. Um, but the process is crucial. So it's science-based, so with real scientists in charge, not politicians. <laughs> Um, which, uh, which are going to actually sow when the, where the soil is fertile. So basically take into account the ability of players to, to make it happen. And the supply side is very important, not only the demand side. It's very important to uh, evaluate, to have real measures who can actually stop projects when they don't work. I know in France, it's almost impossible to stop a project. Uh, when it's financed by the public sector and so on and so forth. I mean, you can associate the private sector. I mean, there are lots of uh, rules like this, which are extremely simple, but more or less don't exist in Europe. And I think it's a shame. And there are the exception, the ERC, for example, being an exception, but, you know, by and large, they are not adopted in Europe. And, you know, if we don't use those rules, then we should not be doing industrial policy. Uh, even so, I think we should. <laughs> Uh, but that's that, otherwise we, are, we have to get rid of the hubris and, and then go for standard R&D subsidies. 
Well, can Thank I you. just add quickly uh, to this? The, it's something that we, the basics that we shouldn't forget, which is education. So education plays a really essential role in both innovation and inequalities. And that, uh, you know, as John said, there's, we see a lot of variation across the productivity in the, in the healthcare, but we really see that too in schools. So not even higher education, but in, in basic school. So there's an enormously important role, particularly in the UK, to play government in investing in um, diffusion of best technologies and improving uh, education at the lower end, uh, as both John and, and John emphasised. Everyone else is named John, so the rest of them emphasised. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, can I just add one aspect to it? It's clear that the government has been successful in much of the innovation. Just look at the vaccine and the BioNTech is, is an ERC funded innovation. Uh, but at the same time, there's a, a very different aspect of the fact that these large firms are never going to be, you know, if we dealt with railways and with electricity as nationalizing them with these new digital technologies, that's never going to be the answer. I mean, you know, the, in a sense, the government is going to be more a referee rather than, than, than a, a player. Uh, um, and, and I think we should also you know, get, get get ready for, for this different role of the government, that the government is never going to be a player anymore with these digital technologies. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that follows, there, there, there's, there, there's a couple of questions here, which uh, I think are quite hard, um, which you've all sort of touched on. Um, and it really, I think, comes straight off the back of what you said there, Jan, which is essentially how uh, should government be a referee in the, in, in the world of, um, of, of these big tech Companies, whereas as, as you've all said, there's network effects, low marginal costs, um, and so on. Uh, so ine almost inevitably, you've got um, the sort of inequalities and the uh, and the monopoly that we've described. Um, so, what what actually um, can government do, and what can it do in a way which um, prevents um, consumers getting the value that they get actually from uh, to some extent the um uh, the, the monopoly position some of these uh, some of these companies are in i mean this i mean these the, the strike me as quite hard questions and uh, but i'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna press you to see how far you can go on those i mean first of all it's it's it's, it's a hard problem to to, to tackle the, i think the main thing that we should not lose our uh, side of is, is the fact that many of these dominant firms create a lot of value and you know we have all these new technologies which are extremely valuable, which we all want, which very often have zero price, right? And some of these apps that we use, and so this is something that we don't want to uh, endanger the, the, the creation of, of, of those. At the same time, these new technologies, because they generate these natural monopolies in some way, because of the data, because of the technology per se, you know, if I have a search engine, I, I have a lot of information, I make the product better. What I do as a firm is the way I price my goods, and it maybe it's advertising or whatever I, I do, the way I price it is, is lacking the competition. I innovate enormously, but at the same time, I price that the pricing is distorted. And I think there we have to uh, uh, think of ways in which we can have sufficient competition. I talked a little bit about this issue of separating platforms from operators. And I think when we have platforms, I, you know, we, we see it on, on the cell towers in Europe, they're at least with 4G, cell tower owners have to allow, they don't like it, but they have to allow competitors on their towers with a rental fee. And this creates competition. You have the advantage of the network, the cell tower network, which is very expensive, you know, high fixed cost, low marginal cost. And at the same time, you have competitors in, in, in the provision. And I think with, with data, it's, it's definitely harder, but there's things that we can do. We can, we can use the networks of Google or the networks of the social networks and still uh, create competition. And I think this is, this is the key thing. What the government, I think, has to do is, is more as a referee, have regulations, set certain rules, set certain say rental fees for using of networks rather than enter as a player that's for sure i i would echo because with jean i mean jean troll actually you know i thought it was a great presentation i've been influenced by jean he had you know we put he put forward lots of the things which are being done 
and and can be done. They're very challenging, but we are, you know, collectively doing them in many different jurisdictions. So just to re-emphasize, you know, there is this thing in the UK called the Digital Markets Unit, which is kind of up and up now, kind of just about up and running and 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 going ahead, which is a sectoral specific, um, you know, regulator of the digital sector in the European Union. There's the Digital Markets Act, which is also setting something up and there's aims to do that in the US as well. And, you know, with all the difficulties that we've described, this is now happening. And, you know, there is an attempt to have a kind of, uh, you know, regulatory structure, which takes seriously the problems that we've, we've been describing. And I think one of the advantages of doing that is that it creates a body of expertise and knowledge. So, you know, as economists, we often worry about capture of regulators by the people being regulated. But what we don't often recognize is that by having a kind of standing organization which collects information, understands the industry, understands the technology more than can be done by a competition authority going in looking at a particular merger case, it actually builds up a body of expertise, the organizational type of economics of this, which I think is really important in trying to tackle some of these really, really, really hard issues. And I, I, I do think that capability is going to be uh, important. And I would also echo all the things that Jean said about, you know, in terms of thinking about our merger and acquisition regime that we have, and we need to coordinate those other countries, Europe is particularly important. Um, you know, we have to think about when a dominant platform is trying to take over a startup, even if that, you know, smaller startup has no market share, we should be looking not at market shares or fundamentally at prices, but at the future, at what could have happened had this promising startup like Instagram or WhatsApp, for example, not been taken over by Facebook. And potentially these become the new platforms, the new rivals, the new innovators of the future. And, you know, that should make us very cautious about allowing very dominant platform companies to, to take over these firms. They really do have to make the case. The burden of proof has to shift from the regulator trying to prove almost without doubt this is going to be a problem to those companies saying, you know, why, why is this not going to be a problem? Because, you know, there's lots of, I think, good reasons to worry about that. And even if the probabilities are, you know, are, 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 are small, the costs are very large. So that, I think, should shift the way that we think about um, a lot of the you know, standards we have for, for merger acquisitions, not just in this country, but around the world. Well, let, let me add a little bit uh, to that in terms of uh, value, which is being created by those platforms. As Jan said, it's, uh, it's terrific in a sense. Also, sometimes it's an excuse actually not to have any regulations. So, uh, those platforms will tell you there is no consumer harm. I mean, look at the great deal we get with Google and, and so on. We, we get a very good deal of those services which are free and wonderful. And that's true. And we don't want regulation which will not be smart and will kill innovation. At the same time, this is not the right argument because it's a two-sided market. And we should not forget that uh, actually the consumer, if they don't pay directly to the platform, they pay indirectly actually quite a lot. So. Uh, both the merchants, uh, their cost of doing business goes up a lot. I mean, when you have to pay 20, 25 or 30 percent of platform, of course, you pass it through to the consumer. And also the advertisers, of course, they pay a lot uh, to those platforms. Uh, and therefore, it again passes uh, the pass uh, the cost through to the consumer. So there is consumer harm, uh, even so consumers pay zero formally. Um, now, what we have to do, in, in my view, but I think it's also the view of the other participant, is that we have to have rules of conduct, which are going to make sure that uh, those firms don't abuse their dominant position and they don't prevent entry. I mean, the notion of contestability, which is an old notion, is uh, it's, it's a kind of meritocracy in a sense for <laughs> For education, you, the new firms can enter. If they are better than the incumbent, they can actually enter. Um, but for that, they must be able to enter. So you have to stop barriers to entry. And they must actually enter, which for that, you have to block uh, defensive mergers. Uh, and if you do that already, you go a long way toward improving things. Right. Um. Rachel isn't jumping in, so I assume that we'll move on to the. Uh, so there's, a, there's another couple of questions here, which are really, I think, about the, um, the sort of empirics of the world. Um, so, uh, what, I mean, to some extent, John, where, where are where are these top ten percent of firms? Are they spread across 
um, the uh, range of industries, or are they um, concentrated in particular areas? And um, there's also a question here, which is related um, about the, you know, are the most successful firms actually in areas with lots of competition or in, are, are they actually in, in areas where um, they've got sort of effectively monopolistic or oligopolistic power? Um, and can I, add, uh, can I add my own to that? I mean, there's, we haven't discussed, we, we, we've talked a lot about tech firms, but we've not talked about financial services um, in all of this, which from the point of view of thinking about inequality has always struck me as quite important. So I, I just wonder where they, those firms appear in, in, in the analysis and, 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 and John probably first. Sure. Um, so the you know the, the most productive firms are spread around the economy. Obviously, the sectors which are more productive than others. So the high tech firms, high R and D, high skilled firms, those high skilled industries. There tends to be you know more highly productive firms in in those those sectors on, on average. But you see that you know you can see this across a wide range of different industries. So you know our analysis both looks, for example, at across the whole economy but then also looks at the relative positions within industries and you also see this increase of inequality of dispersion happening within the sectors it's not just a between sector type of phenomena um the the a question of um you know i i think i was reading the slido questions are these all in more or less it's, it's a very hard question to answer because on you know as we've been discussing think about tech on one level there's a lot of competition there are you know firms coming and innovating and growing and getting larger on the other hand you know when they get to be very large they can potentially help block some some degree of competition so you know there is a strong relationship in my view if you look at the literature on average between you know competition and innovation it is one of the, the forces for increasing productivity and innovation but it's a complex story it's different there's difficult ways of measuring what, what what competition in different sectors i will say and this relates to one of the questions that came up in slido if you look at where british uh industries have been successful that was a question what are the successful industries a lot of the success stories i think in the uk are where we have been open to foreign competition so if you think about biopharmaceuticals and life sciences, where we've had a lot of traditional successes and recent sex with vaccines, uh, there you know, is, a, is a very open sector. If you think about the car industry, you know, in the 70s there was this, you know, what John would call bad industrial policy, which is trying to encourage lots of concentration and put up bar tariff barriers, the terrible disaster. And it wasn't until, in fact, we became much open to foreign investments, uh, joined the, you know, we were in the single market. This actually led to the renaissance of the British mass car industry. Now, it wasn't British companies, it was foreign companies coming in, but they were creating, you know, good jobs and high productivity and a, and a flourishing industry. So I do think one of the best ways to get competition is to being open to, um, you know, foreign markets. And so, you know, that is a big worry, I think, to me with Brexit and potential being, you know, of reducing access to foreign markets. So I, I do think that was, that's one way of thinking about the relative uh, success of UK industries that the people were asking. Do you want to say anything about financial services, John? I think you... I mean, so in, in what... Sorry, so I say, I mean, the, the, you know, the core analysis that we showed took out financial services okay. because of the difficulty of again measuring finance if you put them in there are some you know really very large and and you know you know big big firms in there you you still see uh increasing differences between firms within that sector from from, from memory but i think that you know i think the 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 core analysis we did was on non-financial you know, we dropped the difficult to measure financial services sector like we did for the government sector, but you can still put those in and, and you would find broadly, I think, similar results. Yeah. I just wanted to add one point to, to, to John's uh, points, which is that if you look across industries and sectors, size is varying a lot because, you know, some sectors have typically large firms. If you look at retail, very large firms, biotech, very small firms. But what you see within each of these sectors, and that's what John finds and what uh, other people find, is that, you know, you see that the larger firms within your sector, you could be a small biotech firm compared to Walmart, but you can still be a very large firm compared to the other biotech firms. And, and, and it's really, you know, size is not necessarily the best indicator of these dominant firms, but, you know, within your sector, size really, uh, really matters. And then the other thing is, you know, what it's kind of a, a bit, 
kind of an, a, an ironic way of looking at it. Sometimes people say, I have a, a competitive firm. What does that mean? Well, a competitive firm could be a firm that doesn't face competition. Because if you have a competitive firm, it makes high profits and it's very uh, uh, successful. So, you know, if, if you look at Google, it's a very competitive firm because it, it gets rid of all its competition. <clears throat> but the reason why it's competitive, of course, is it faces a basically a national monopoly in its uh, search engine uh, market. And I think we have to be very careful how we talk about being competitive. It's a bit like, you know, sometimes people talk about this is a pro-business policy. Pro-business is really not pro-market. And, 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 and very often we, we tend to confuse the language on these uh, issues. Um, we're getting towards the end. There's a couple of interesting questions from Alex Bryson here, not necessarily closely related, but I think um, I'll ask them together. Um, one is, uh, he says the work he did in the USA suggested growth in productivity dispersion across workplaces only contributed a little bit to the growth in wage inequality across workplaces. And what's that relationship like in the UK? And I think probably, John, you'd be best placed, I guess, to answer that and maybe Jan as well. And then his other one is about our firms innovating a way complementarities between low and high school workers by outsourcing their low value added activities and might this limit superstar firm demand for low skilled workers and perhaps um, perhaps Rachel and Jean could uh, tackle that one but but tackle whichever you like but I think this will be for each of you your last um, your last shot so uh, should we um, should, 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 should we start with um, John and, and, and go through as you first first appeared? Sure. So thanks, Alex. So, so the um, I think it's similar in the UK. So the the increase of product dispersion across firms has contributed to increased inequality amongst individuals, but it's not the dominant force. I think there's many things which are much more important than the uh, increase of overall dis dis firm level productivity dispersion. Um, it's, it's hard to get the perfect number because productivity is hard to measure, and we do know, particularly in the US, that. Um, if you look at overall individual wage inequality, the vast majority of that increase has been a between firm increase. So it's the, you know, this, this work by, you know, my, my, uh, my former PhD student, IFS colleague, Nick Bloom, um, looking at the, uh, the social security data shows that, you know, within firm inequality in the US, for example, hasn't increased very much. The, 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 you know, the CEOs have pulled away from the rest, but amongst the rest of the people within firms inequality has increased. It really is this between firm component. There's increasing differences between firms and wages. Now, that is not just productivity of those firms. That's a lot of other things. Maybe it's the skilled workers working with the skilled workers, the unskilled workers, the unskilled workers. But that between firm element of what's happened to wages is incredibly important. Yes, we don't know that in the UK, actually. We haven't got as good data to see that. But I, I suspect similar things might be happening here. Um, so that would be an interesting thing to look at for future researchers. Yeah, I, I just want to completely echo that. I mean, the, the between firm inequality, a lot of it is driven by high skilled workers working together and low skilled workers working together. There's some, some work done on, on Swedish data where they have very detailed data that even in the tech sector, you see a lot of this inequality going on because we think of tech as high skill, but you also have the help desk function, which is now completely outsourced and you have companies help desk and and things like uh, uh, call centers and, 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 and the like, which are very low skilled, but tech sectors. And you see that going on in all sectors, uh, this, this, this kind of division between, uh, between firms and then being driven really by skills, skilled workers working together, high skilled with high and low with low in, in, in different firms. Paul, well, I'm going to just address a different question that I can answer more interestingly, which is the, the current top question, which is about the labour market policies. We all mentioned labour market policies as being important. And what role do collective bargaining and trade unions play in that? And I think there's an important distinction to make between the US and the UK. So Jan showed that really shocking picture from the US of the very strong productivity growth, but the very stagnant wage growth. And so there you might imagine that uh, policies that facilitate work or bargaining power might be very important. However, in the UK, we don't have that big productivity growth to bargain over. 
So really, I go back to education policy and policies that will improve productivity, because there's no point increasing workers bargaining power if there's no productivity to bargain over. So, you know, that I think for the UK, things are a little different there. It's not that workers bargaining power is important, but we have to have something to bargain over before that's helpful. That's a great point. Um, John, last word. Last word, not the best one because I'm not the expert on outsourcing, but let me just notice that it's likely to be uh, country specific for a good reason. I mean, we economists, we tend, tend to think of outsourcing as a, as a make or buy decision, you know, vertical integration decision. But of course, there are many other reasons which have to do with regulation, which condition outsourcing. So for example, in the environmental world, unless you have stronger extended liabilities and all the dirty activities will be done or will be outsourced in order to avoid liability. Same thing in the in the labor world. If you don't have experience rating, then what's going to happen is that you are going to outsource your uh, risky uh, labor uh, deals uh, to other firms. And there is a third reason, which is profit sharing. So that has been mentioned several times today, and this is very important. So. If, if you are Google, uh, you want to share your profits with some key employees and you want to keep them and, and also uh, keep confidentiality and the like. But for other things, uh, you don't want to share the profits and, and obviously you are going to outsource those activities. So I'm just making the point that actually this is, uh, it's not only economics that determine outsourcing, it's also a kind of a profit redistribution and, and tax liabilities and the like, which also, uh, important and, and that we would expect it to depend on, on the country, obviously. Well, thank you very much. It is bang on 11 o'clock, so we ought to um, stop at that point. Thank you all for uh, broadly keeping to time for, as I said, I think one of the more, mo most fascinating uh, webinars I've been at for, for a long time. Thank you to everyone for listening. The papers and I think the slides are, are or will very soon be up on the IFS uh, website, so do, uh, do look for them there. And do join us for the next in our series of um, uh, inequality, deep inequality uh, webinars, which will be in a couple of weeks on, um, on labour markets uh, with Steve Machin uh, and others. But thank you so much to, to John, to Jan, to Rachel and to Jean. Um, and I hope to see um, many of you very soon. <laughs>